Certainly we give honor to our great God and I appreciate the wonderful president of this illustrious institution. I want to thank him for that wonderful and kind introduction. Let's give our new president a hand. What a gracious and classy. We are certainly appreciative to all of the staff and faculty of Morehouse and to the board of the directors and board of trustees of this illustrious institution and to the class of 2019. Confession is good for the soul. I was having a moment there because I remember in 1993 when I was sitting where these graduates are sitting now, I didn't make it to our baccalaureate service that Saturday because I was afraid. I was afraid because when I left here that Friday afternoon, at that time, I was not sure if all of my classes had been passed. I was also not sure whether or not the financial aid had cleared my account. And so I decided to stay at home and wait until Sunday because Morehouse was notorious for pulling you out of the line on Saturday or Sunday. And so I said I'd wait, I'd wait until Sunday and so to keep myself from being embarrassed twice, I'd be embarrassed once. And so I missed my baccalaureate that Saturday to hear Dr. Gardner Calvin Taylor. I came that Sunday and sat to the left about three quarters of the way. And when Dr. Watts and the others came by, I'm so glad to announce that my name was in the list. And so, and so today is special. It's not just your baccalaureate, but it's mine too, 26 years later. I certainly would be remiss if I didn't recognize and appreciate uh, the legend, Dr. Lawrence E. Carter. I want to thank him for being such a wonderful inspiration uh, in my life. Certainly my wife is here, Andrea, she's here, and my sister and brother John and Jada and a few people from our church are here. I want to thank them for being here as well. I want to call your attention for a second to the book of Revelation, and I want to ask that you stand with me just for a second. And uh, two things I'd like for you to do as you stand with us. The first thing, if you everybody could take one step to the left, everybody one step to the left, one step back to the right. Uh, I just want to guarantee that nobody could leave here saying the preacher didn't move me. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, it reads thusly, after this, you may be seated. At the time of this text, the ruling emperor in Rome was an interesting fellow by the name of Domitian. He is the last of the Flavian dynasty and his life is intriguing. He's only in that position because of his connection with his father, Vespasian. After the death of his father and the death of his brother, Domitian took the rulership of emperor of Rome. The time of this text, Rome was considered to be the citadel of the Caesars. It was a darling of the human race. Rome had been that place where Virgil sang and Cicero played. Amazingly, Domitian has become the emperor there in Rome, but there are no distinguishable qualities about his life. In a real sense, he's only there because of the legacy of his father. Amazingly now, he is the top leader in Rome. He is leading the military armies of Rome. He is the commander-in-chief of those armies. But yet he himself had no formal military training. Somehow, some way, he was able to 
be disqualified when it was time for others to be enlisted in military service. Not only has he not been qualified to lead the Army from a military perspective, but Domitian is also interesting because he has utilized religious, military, and cultural propaganda in order to boost his height to some type of cult personality. His nationalistic overtones allowed him to be concerned about ensuring that the borders of Rome were defense properly. If you'd allow me to colloquially state, he was concerned with making Rome great again. Anybody who did not believe or adhere to the teachings of Domitian in a dictatorial or authoritative type of way, he would ensure that they be guilty of treason. And even in his old age, it is interesting that he faced bankruptcy with regularity. And only improper business practices allowed him to maintain that position. Not only was he disqualified and not qualified from a military perspective and no distinguishable traits about him, using propaganda, military, religious, and cultural propaganda, but he was also insecure at the conclusion of his life because he suffered from extreme hair loss. <laughs> and that he was the first emperor of Rome to be known for wearing wigs <laughs> and doing a lot in regard of health care. I'm not talking about anybody. I'm just talking about <laughs> the Roman Emperor Domitian. He believed in following the God of Apollo. He, he did not believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, nor Jacob. And yet at the time when he was about disenfranchising and about oppressing those who did not share his milieu, around that same time does a gentleman by the name of John come on the scene of a different ethnic persuasion, of perhaps of a darkened hue but he stands in defiance uh, to the decrees of Domitian, and as a result, he was exiled. He was banished. Domitian sent immigration officials uh, to get John, to let John know he was no longer welcome there in the Greco-Roman Empire. Uh, but in spite of the suffering, in spite of the chicanery and the duplicity and the pusillanimous behavior of Domitian, John had a faith. John, as a young man, had heard the carousel of the euangelion, the preaching of the good news of Jesus Christ, and believed that I am because we are. And John inevitably was exiled to an isle called Patmos, to spend the rest of his life banished and isolated from family, friends, and familiar surroundings. But yet while there on Patmos, a minority in the Greco-Roman Empire, someone whose skin has perhaps been kissed by the king of the solar system. And in spite of his social economic loss and lack, John had something uh, that you could not get from the Greco-Roman Empire. Uh, God spoke to John while on this Isle of Patmos, allowed John to go through a process to see could he uh, receive and regurgitate and dictate information gave a message of the right to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And after proving John through a process, proving that John could receive, proving that John could ascertain and distribute education, is where we penetrate the periphery and the pericope of this particular passage. For John says, after I was processed, John says, after I was accused of treason, after I was stripped from everything comfortable and familiar, I want to know that after this, that my best days started not prior to the banishment, but after the banishment. My best days were gained even in the face of an authoritative leader called Domitian. And I want to say to the graduating class of 2019 that in a real sense, our socioeconomic context, our social status is similar to that of John. 
Uh, for we live in a day of disenfranchisement. We live in a day where bigotry and prejudice. We live in a day where it seems that supremacy has come to the forefront. And sadly it seems that even the systems of our world, the political expediency also harmonizing with those of a sick and theological perspective. That this world is darkened by this Domitian-like spirit that's coming from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. But I stand today to see hundreds of new Johns who are committed to not bowing down to the decrees of this neo-Domitian, who are determined to hold our heads up, our shoulders square. John says, it was after God processed me. He says that God gave me something. I think that something that's very, very powerful because the question is asked, what happens after today? What happens after tomorrow? And I want to give you something, gentlemen, that I believe bless John that can bless all of our lives. For John says, after this, I want you to know, after all the foolishness, after all of the troubles of the mission, John says, after this, number one, that was a clear vision. He says, after this, I looked. And when I looked, John says, I saw that a door had been opened in heaven. I want to say to you, brothers, that after this, after commencement tomorrow, that after you've received your degrees, please know that all the doors have not closed. It's at that moment that the doors have just begun to open for you. And the blessing here is that John does not say after this, I looked and I saw doors as they had begun to open. John says, when I looked, I saw doors were already open. I, I want to ease some of your, quell some of your fears. Many of you may be wondering, what's the next chapter going to hold for me? Where am I going to work? Where am I going to live? How am I going to pay back these student loans? But what I want you to know is this. The door is not getting ready to open. John says if you just look, you will see the doors have already been opened. As a matter of fact, God is not getting ready to open doors. God has already opened doors. As a matter of fact, God opens the door before God creates the door. And once the door is already open in the heaven, is all you have to do is find the trajectory and the traction to get to the door that's already been opened. You gotta have a clear vision, a clear vision. It reminded me when I came to this college uh, some 31 years ago and was trying to figure out whether I would play football or not because I played football, was an athlete, had college opportunities. And I remember about this whole thing about open doors. Reminded me as a quarterback, we'd go back to three, five, or seven step drop in order to throw the ball to the wide receivers. And as a quarterback, we have plays that were called timing plays. And that's when the wide receiver, the tight end, would go out and run a route, whether it be a post, whether it be a fly route. And the job, my job as a quarterback was not to throw the ball to the receiver, but rather to throw the ball to a spot. The receiver's job on the line of scrimmage was to make sure he knew his particular route. He had someone in front of him called a cornerback or a strong safety. He had to understand his route and shake off whatever was in front of him and just get to the spot. And my job was to throw the ball to the spot. And if the receiver would shake off the opposition, not listen to the stands and get to the spot, by the time they turn around and lift their hand, the ball has already been thrown. I stop by to tell every graduate of 2019 that God, your heavenly quarterback, has already dropped back into the pocket. He's passing balls to the spot. He's passed the ball of economic opportunities. He's passed the ball of entrepreneurship. He's passed the ball of debt liquidation. So what do you have to do? Remove the distraction, shake it off, and get to the spot. And when you get to your spot, lift up your hands, and the blessing will already be waiting for you. It's called a clear vision. Habakkuk said, write the vision and make it plain. God has not given you all of what you receive just to rest on your laurels but to get a clear vision of how we can make our world a better place john says after this there was a clear vision but after this john says there also was a customized vehicle he says in verse 2 after this i looked and behold a door was open in heaven in verse 2 john says and immediately i was in the spirit ironically this same spirit met john in the first chapter the same spirit that met him 
when he got to Patmos, the same spirit that has met him here while he's facing exile and banishment. John says, immediately I was in, not my resume. Immediately I was in, not uh, quantum physics, not in my algebraic formulas or geometric equations. I was in, not astrology, not in eco econ. I was not in business administration or philosophy or political science. He says, I was in the spirit. Uh, the idea is that you and I can't get through open doors or won't be able to sustain after this moment if you forget the power of the spirit that has brought you to this place and point in life. I recognize now that many of you have been here four years, some of you five years like I was when I sat where you're sitting now. And because you've read so many books, you've learned so much that somehow if you're not careful, you can begin to believe that it's not about faith and it's not about God. For some of you, you've reduced God to some abstract metaphysical ambiguity, some figment of a gullible imagination. But let me tell you here, if ever you begin to have a crisis of faith about the spirit, please find grandmama, please find grandpa, and let them tell you about how they had to scrub floors for your fathers and mothers to have an opportunity to get higher education. They didn't get here by might. They didn't get here by education. They got here by the Spirit of God. That same Spirit that brought you to Morehouse. That same Spirit that's kept you through all of the distractions, the beautiful things at Spelman, the wonderful things at Clark. That same Spirit that's maintained you up until this point will be the same Spirit that will guide you into a higher dimension in life. Make sure you have a customized vehicle that whatever I do, I'm traveling by the Spirit of God. I'm here to tell you the Spirit of God will keep you. The power of God will sustain you. God's hand on your life. I don't care what you call him, Allah, the Most High. Make sure you take God with you. A man went on a business trip. and got on the business trip. He took his clothes out of his luggage, set up the ironing board, and began to iron his shirt, getting ready for a business meeting. And as fate would have it, as he was ironing his shirt, brothers and sisters, the shirt and the man began to have a conversation. As that man was ironing that shirt, that shirt looked at the man and the shirt said to the man, man, are you trying to burn me? The man kept ironing the shirt, said, no shirt, I'm not trying to burn you. Shirt, you have some wrinkles on you and I, you don't look your best like this. So I'm applying heat because I'm trying to make you better. The shirt said back to the man, well, man, how do you know you're not going to burn me? That dog on iron is hot. The man said to the shirt, shirt, please know that I bought you. Shirt, you've been bought with the price. And I won't harm anything that I purchased with the price. And then the shirt looked back at the man and said, well, how do you know that it's not going to put a hole in me? That heat is too much. The heat of Morehouse, the struggles are too much. And the man said back to the shirt, well, shirt, before I began to iron you, I looked at your tag. I looked at your label and I saw that you were a cotton shirt. So I preset the iron for a cotton temperature because I wouldn't put a linen temperature on a cotton shirt. I know just how much you can bear and I won't put any more on you. Stop giving you a way of escape. Every graduate of 2019 should thank God that the power of God has kept you and didn't put any more on you than you could handle. And when you couldn't handle it, God got underneath the load with it. Whatever you do, after this, after this, make sure you have a clear vision. After this, you need a customized vehicle. Travel by the Spirit, by the power of God. But then after this, finally, not only do you need a clear vision, not only do you need a customized vehicle, the Spirit, but thirdly, we need characteristics of victory. John says, as a young man, as an older man, I was able to overthrow everything that Domitian tried to put on me. I went to a higher level. I walked through different doors. I saw something I'd never seen before. Although I was on Patmos, I saw paradise. I saw the abode of Christ and the deceased. I saw something that I'd never seen before. He says, and I saw four creatures there. The first one, he says, in verse 7, was like a lion. The second had a face of a man. The third was like an ox, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. There are some inconclusivity regarding what these creatures actually represent. 
Some say they represent Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but they represent some other characteristics. The lion here in that seventh verse of Revelation 4 is not a demonic beast. It's a divine beast, not a satanic beast, a sovereign beast. And that lion there represents courage that says after this, after commencement, after baccalaureate, you're going to need courage. Uh, I want you to know that it's the courage of our ancestors that has brought us. It was courage that allowed Marcus Garver to pan that, pin that Pan-African vision. It was courage to develop the University of Timbuktu in the city of San Corre. It was courage that allowed Martin King and Vernon Johns and Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker and the courage of our ancestors that has stood and def defied what has happened in terms of injustice. That same courage now must be ours. There must be a return to the courage of Dr. King who'd write the letter from the Birmingham jail. There must be a courage because I want you to know that we've not yet overcome. I want you to know that seeing that a mirror has been held to the face of America and America's more fragmented than it's been uh, in, its, in its history. And now political expediency has allowed bigotry to rise like we've not seen it since the days of the civil rights movement. It's going to take courage to stand. It's going to take courage to go and be politically active. It's going to take courage to go back to our communities and realize that integration won't be our answer. We can't depend on the government to save our people, but we're going to stand and pull ourselves up with the help of God by our own bootstraps. It's going to take courage. It's also going to take uh, patience. Uh, I want you to know because we've rested on our laurels that we've allowed things to turn around. Patience will be our reality. This world won't turn around tomorrow. The same patience that you've exhibited, it's going to take patience to turn this world around. We're also going to need intelligence. Intelligence says it makes no sense to call yourself pro-life. Putting in policies to demand that a woman's body should be run by men in the name of pro-life but have said nothing about the lives of babies locked up in cages on our southern borders. It's going to take some intelligence. It's going to take some intelligence to realize that staying home in 2020 is not going to bring us to answer. It's going to take some intelligence to realize that we're going to have to do more than what we've done. It's going to take some intelligence to realize that we still have to be civically and socially active. It's going to take some courage. After this, it's going to take some patience. It's going to take some intelligence. But then John says, and the fourth one's like a flying eagle. And the eagle here represents strength. I want you to know after this, it's going to take some strength. I want you to know that what you're going to need, men, as you walk into a new dispensation, is more strength. The strength of an eagle. The eagle is unlike any other bird. For when other birds get the message that the wintry blast of winter are approaching, other birds form a family reunion in the distant horizon and then migrate to the southern sun. But the eagle is distinct, for the eagle being a meteorologist by instinct, when he or she becomes aware because of the climatic conditions of the clouds that the storm is approaching. The eagle don't run south to Jamaica listening to the Migos. <laughs> but the eagle takes his strong eagle eye and looks directly into the eye of the storm. I never shall forget Dean Carter when I sat here in freshman orientation. And you said on that Thursday afternoon, look to your left, look to your right. One of you is not going to be here in the next four or five years. I looked to my left and I asked the gentleman sitting next to me what his GPA was. He told me his was 4.0. I looked to my right and asked the gentleman next to me what's your ACT, SAT score. He told me what his was, 300 points higher than mine. I looked at myself and realized I'd made it here on academic probation. I picked up my phone and called my mom and said, you might as well come get me now because this <laughs> Dean Carter said, one of you not going to be here and the left or right more qualified than I. But I'm so glad. I didn't allow my insecurities, I didn't allow my insufficiency, I didn't allow the stuff I played around with in high school to deter me, but I had a strength of a praying grandmama. Matter of fact, I'm so glad somebody prayed for me. 
had me on their mind, took the time and prayed for me. I'm so glad. Bible says I've never seen the righteous forsaken. No, it's she begging for bread. I said, God, would you keep me? He said, well, I want you to look directly into the eye of the storm. Signed up for math and they assigned me to somebody by the name of Dr. Gore. Uh, some of you don't remember Dr. Gore. Thank God you don't know Dr. Gore. I said, listen, mama, come get me. I, I can't handle this. Take me to the military. She said, no, 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 no. People have suffered and died and bled, so you have a right to have an opportunity. And can I tell you what I did like some of you did? I held my head up, went to sleep in class, struggled and strained, did all I could to do the best I could to not be a disappointment to my family, to be like that eagle and look directly into the eye of academic endeavor, the academic achievement. I began to experience storms of at drop period, storms of low midterm grades, but I said, I'm not gonna go home, I'm gonna flap my wings and ride directly into the eye of the storm. And just when it seemed like the storm was gonna get me, just when it seemed like the storm was gonna get some of you, you didn't quit, but you launched like the eagle and you rise. above the storm. Class of 2019, I'm here to tell you that you might run into some storms in your next dimension, but flap your wings and remember what you did at Morehouse. And remember the words of Isaiah, has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainted not, neither is he weary. There's no searching of his understanding. For he giveth the power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases their strength. For even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men sometimes shall utterly fall. But, I said but, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like the eagle. They'll run and not get weary. Shake somebody's hand and say, keep on waiting on him. Keep on waiting on him. Keep on waiting on him. And be not dismayed whatever betides you. God will. Woo! Take care of you.